welcome everyone to the United States Energy Association USAID program on modernization of the grid. Uh, as you might expect, it is a critical issue uh, in uh, certainly in the United States, but well beyond worldwide. Um, given the new inputs of energy, the new demands on energy, uh, the new cybersecurity threats, which are out there uh, uh, just about everywhere, just the tremendous number of demands, uh, changes in policy, uh, and the necessities for continuous improvement and modernization on the grid. And I'm so honored uh, to be here on behalf of the United States Energy Association, but even more honored to introduce uh, the wonderful USAID people who have worked so hard, uh, both at USAID itself and with volunteers, uh, as we see uh, joining us this morning. You'll hear from the very experts on the true cutting edge of the cutting edge with respect to grid modernization. Critical, critically important, uh, domestically and international. Uh, USAID, just uh, for your information, works very closely with us. Uh, we also, USEA, uh, convene and uh, uh, provide a forum for the US energy industry and beyond, but we work very, very closely with USAID on multiple projects over 104 countries over the years all around the world, uh, trying to improve the well-being of humanity uh, by providing energy, safe energy, improving energy practices. So it's a real honor to be uh, allowed to introduce this wonderful program. And I look forward, Kristen, uh, to hearing from you uh, and uh, the rather extremely impressive uh, group of, uh, of contributors we have this morning. Kristen. Thanks so much, Sheila. Welcome, everyone. I would like to thank you all for joining us here today. My name is Kristen Madler. I work in USAID's Global Energy and Infrastructure Office, and I manage our cooperative agreement that USAID holds with the US Energy Association called the Energy Utility Partnership Program. I would like to thank USDA for organizing this event and their continued commitment to the Energy Utility Partnership Program as many of you know, USAID and USDA have been working together for over 25 years to utilize US public and private sector expertise as a critical resource for modernizing developing country power sectors. And we consistently hear from our developing country partners that utilities um, highly value this peer-to-peer -peer engagement. And today's presentations will build on our 15-part digitalization cybersecurity webinar series, which shared best practices on policy development, utility preparedness, and regulatory frameworks. And you can find all of those webinars on USDA's website. Grid modernization efforts will integrate all sources of electricity, help to solve energy storage and distrib distributed generation challenges, strengthen grid security, and can provide a critical platform platform for innovation to deliver resilient, reliable, flexible, secure, sustainable, and affordable electricity. And in the grid modernization series, we plan to cover a variety of topics to help utilities better plan, share approaches to perform critical assessments, and introduce strategies and roadmaps to encourage smart investments. We will introduce you to industry thought leaders who will highlight key concepts, tools, and technologies that can measure, analyze, predict, protect, and control the grid of the future. I would like to take, thank today's electric power industry leaders, Mark Bio and Jeff Smith, for carving out time to share your unique perspectives as panelists today. We greatly appreciate your time and commitment, so thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll pass the floor back to USDA. Jake, over to you, and thanks for your help in coordinating everything for this event. Of course. Um, thanks for joining us today, Kristen, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good evening to everyone. Um, and thank you for attending our first uh, webinar on our grid modernization series. Uh, my name is Jake Swanson. I'm a program coordinator at the U.S. Energy Association um, on the Energy Utility Partnership Program based in Washington, D.C., um, please note that this webinar is being recorded and that all participants are muted with their video turned off. 
Uh, you're welcome and encouraged to post uh, questions in the chat or the Q&A box below. Um, I'll be monitoring them and passing them on to our presenters as appropriate. Uh, just to give a brief background on USEA, we're a nonprofit membership association of public and private energy related organizations, corporations, and government agencies. USEA represents the broad interests of the US energy sector by increasing the understanding of energy issues, both domestically and internationally, through capacity building activities and events like this one. This series of webinars is financed through our cooperative agreement with USAID. Um, and in particular through USAID's Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation. Uh, you can find uh, past webinars at the bottom of our website at usca.org slash events. Um, today's webinar will cover trends and best practices on grid modernization um, with a case study on distribution automation. Um, today, we have the pleasure of having Jeff Smith, who is a senior program manager leading EPRI's grid oper operations and planning research area um, that's focused on modernizing both transmission and distribution operations and planning. Over the course of Jeff's career, he has focused primarily on power system planning, modeling, and simulations of the bulk system all the way down to rooftop DER um, on the distribution system. Jeff earned his BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering from Mississippi State University. Um, we also have Mark Vallow, who is the uh, manager of Smart Grid Performance at First Energy. Uh, Mark's group provides Smart Grid conceptual development, um, and he ensures that Smart Grid technology that is deployed uh, achieves the expected results, including interactions and reports to applicable state commissions. Mark has 37 years of experience at First Energy and holds a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering from Cleveland State University. Um, so with that, I will uh, pass the floor over to Jeff. Let me just pull up your presentation. All right. Great. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate that. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. So uh, first of all, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, USAID and U.S. Energy Association for the opportunity to speak today. Um, it's an incredible effort what you guys are doing here and with the webinar series, uh, particularly grid modernization. It's a it's a very it's a hot topic right now uh, and a lot of activity happening in this space. Um, so I'm going to give a, a brief primer um, on what we're seeing across the industry as it relates to grid modernization. There are three things. Um, that I wanted to sort of highlight um, before I get started. For one, all utilities are going through some form of grid modernization activity, whether that be in transmission or distribution. Um, and each utility, um, secondly, whether you're in North America, whether you're in Europe, Asia, Africa, um, each utility is in a different place along the path to grid modernization. However, regardless of where a utility is in that path, there are lessons that can be learned from each other. So there are three things. One, everybody's going through grid modernization. Everyone's in a different place, but everyone can learn from each other. Um, so the pr presentation I'm gonna give a, uh, today is a brief overview of some of the things that we're seeing across the industry as it relates to so, some of these activities. Um, and the presentation is gonna, gonna span both transmission and distribution. So it'll be a somewhat concise, um, uh, summary of some of the activities. So before we get started on the next slide, I want to give a brief overview uh, of EPRI, if you're not familiar with EPRI. Um, we're, we're an independent organization. Uh, we're objective, scientific-based, nonprofit organization, actually, um, and focusing on addressing reliability, efficiency, affordability, health, safety, as well as the environment as it relates to the electric grid. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization chartered to serve the public benefit, um, and we're a collaborative organization as well. Uh, we bring together scientists, engineers, academic researchers, and uh, as well as industry experts from around the globe. Um, our customers are um, served are, are represented in uh, roughly 40 countries around the world and over a thousand organizations. So it gives you a brief overview of what of who EPRI is. So on the next slide, I'm gonna sort of jump into sort of the, some of the key drivers behind grid modernization. As mentioned, uh, grid modernization is happening around the globe. 
Um, and some of those key drivers, drivers are decarbonization. That's one of the key drivers, either through local government goals for meeting renewables, uh, whether DER, bulk renewables or storage, or, or meeting electrification targets. Um, regardless of where a utility is located along that path to modernization, though, no single utility doesn't need to modernize some portion of their system to address these growing challenges. Um, other, um, uh, other drivers, climate change, extreme weather, uh, whether that be wildfires, um, or, uh, uh, such as what happened in California or Australia, or the extreme, uh, extreme weather conditions, such as what happened in Texas uh, this most recently. But then there's also the uh, digitalization uh, that's a driver with the fact that we have new technologies available that we can with, that we can leverage, whether that be uh, intelligent electronic devices or data processing in the back office or uh, a distributed data processing out in the field um, or, or new ways of gathering or managing processing data. Um, and then lastly, the aging infrastructure, that's another driver behind um, modernization, um, even, you know, regardless of where you are, either in North America or Europe or Asia, the assets are aging, uh, particularly for developed countries. Some of these assets have been in the field for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, um, and that's the wires, you know, the, the underground cables, the transformers. So a lot of drivers behind grid modernization. But there are also some, some common goals that we see across the industry. And some of which we've had for a long time that consistent are consistent, you know, providing safe, affordable, and reliable energy for all customers. Now we're adding to that some new, some newer goals in the, in the recent years: sustainability targets, making sure the system's sustainable, um, u- utilizing uh, renewable resources, making sure the system is efficient. Uh, but more recently, we're adding things like flexibility and resiliency um, to some of the goals as well. So in the next slide, I'll sort of describe six key areas we see utilities focusing their efforts on as it relates to grid modernization. Um, the first of which is this grid is grid infrastructure. It, it starts with the wires and the transformers um, that provide the global network of electricity to flow. So the grid infrastructure itself. Um, then there's the supporting technology, uh, the communication information systems that are required to monitor and coordinate and control assets. And then it's the digitalization, the information, the data, um, the actual data um, that is collected and collated about the system. Um, what is the grid doing now? Uh, what, is, what has it done? And what will it do in the future? And then there's the actual functional roles, the operations, the operational systems um, and staff and resources that provide the essential services during real time. And then there's the planning, the looking to the future to provide no regrets approaches to overcoming the challenges of the future. And then lastly, it's the workforce, uh, the, the actual people. Um, it's not just about wires. It's not just about technology or processes. It's about the workforce. It's about the people. So those are the six main areas I was going to sort of briefly cover as it relates to grid modernization. And the, on the next slide, I'm going to cover the first one, which is essentially grid infrastructure. So there's some key areas that we're seeing as it relates to uh, a focus on grid infrastructure, one of which is actually asset monitoring. Um, So we have the ability um, more so than ever to collect data, um, different types of data, whether that be through AMI or sensors or imagery, um, and utilities are working to understand what to collect and then how to use it at that point. Um, th- this is essentially some of this data collection is a little bit more mature, typically speaking, on the transmission, uh, but the trend is growing towards, towards more asset monitoring and data analytics on the distribution system as well. Some of the examples uh, would be the, uh, deploying monitors to assess uh, transformer or bushing health uh, in, in the substations or using line monitoring devices to come up with uh, to establish dynamic line ratings so the system can be pushed harder, uh, if you will. And again, the go- sort of as it, as it relates to asset monitoring, some of the key goals are focusing on safety and reliability, um, you know, basically knowledge of whether an asset is at an imminent risk of failure. Um, that will enable actions that can be taken to address safety um, of both the customer as well as um, utility personnel. And then there's workforce deployment as well as condition-based maintenance basically taking maintenance actions um, that can be initiated at appropriate times, therefore increasing cost effectiveness. But also utilities are looking at uh, new line designs. 
design and build, designing and building transmission lines with either a reduced environmental impact or increased power transfer um, with increased structural and electrical resiliency. Um, and resiliency is a major driver behind a lot of changes. And I've got a link to an article um, where a utility was looking at deploying new technologies um, on, on their distribution poles that enable the system to be restored um, more quickly rather than replacing poles, letting certain parts break. So um, a link to that article is there. Another area where utilities are starting to deploy and modernize is around UAV applications. Um, either that uh, using aerial imagery and drone technologies to do it for doing routine visual ex inspections, um, but also for doing emergency and disaster recovery um, damage evaluations. So a number of activity uh, uh, opportunities there, leveraging new technologies that are available. But also, um, utilities are looking at are actually upgrading their voltage on their system. Many many systems are still having are operating under. I'll say many. There are a number of systems throughout um, North America and abroad that are operating at lower voltages, like 4,000 volts, 4 kV, and that has limitations as it relates to how much load can be served, how much DER can be accommodated. So, so a number of utilities are upgrading their systems to a 15 kV class, so upgrading their voltage class of their systems. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to talk about the next major bullet, which, which is information and communication technologies. And I know this was a this is a, this, a subject that was covered previously and more in depth. So I'm just going to just highlight it here, um, just for the sake of completeness. Um, obviously, that's an important component to grid modernization, and a whole series is dedicated to that. But main things I wanted to highlight just here would, would be, the, for example, the telecommunications infrastructure itself. You know, understanding the opportunities and risks associated with new technologies, as well as policy decisions, whether that be le le leveraging 900 megahertz systems or new 5G technologies, and then essentially applying best practices uh, from the commercial carriers where a lot of utilities are looking to get into that space. And then there's, of course, cybersecurity assessment planning. That's obviously a critical component as we start to, um, as, the, as the system becomes more digitized, digitalized, we start leveraging these new technologies, uh, we start connecting into the systems more distributed, cybersecurity and assessment of that and preventing um, and preparing the system for cybersecurity attacks is critically important. And then lastly, sort of the enterprise architecture and integration and sort of the data integration um, across an enterprise and developing new architectures and guidance around that as it relates to either um, data integration or grid net model management and that sort of thing. So on the next slide, um, it's, it, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the information itself and um, some of the um, sort of the, the background of what can happen once you have um, um, this, this information communication technology infrastructure, some of the things that utilities are actually looking to use to digitize or digitalize their system. Main thing, obviously, is converting all, all the devices, the field devices, the relays, um, uh, the controllers from analog to digital. It gives a lot more flexibility to the system, um, new capabilities. But also utilities um, are actually still in the process of converting their systems to GIS, uh, converting their systems from the, um, from the wall maps or the paper maps to an actual GIS system and putting that system in place so that the, they have better visibility and better awareness of the assets in the field. And then there's actually deployment of sensors. Um, that's a key area that a lot of utilities are, are focusing on, that visibility of what's happening on the system particularly in the distribution space. Um, transmission, for the most part, we see a lot, that's a very mature area as it relates to monitoring and sensing. Distribution, however, is not that case. So we're seeing a lot, uh, um, there's a need to provide more visibility and awareness to what's happening on the edge of the grid, if you will, um, as it relates to enabling uh, some of these new functionality and new capabilities that are asked of the distribution system. And so that means getting back to, the, to some of the back office systems as well, data management. So if we're collecting data, how do we manage that data? Uh, how do we manage our new models? And some utilities are actually deploying some artificial intelligence techniques um, as it relates to um, digitalization activities. And there's actually a, a webinar series that I linked into the presentation here that gives a brief overview of some of the things that, we're, that others are seeing throughout the industry. So the next slide I'm going to talk about um, it's getting into the actual functions 
um, some of the key functions for, for operating and planning the grid. And the first one is modernizing operations. We know we all know that mo that operations that the primary focus of operations um, is essentially keeping the lights on. Um, that's that's the primary role of operations. So um, some of the things that um, um, as it, as it relates to modernization, um, you know, it, it means we need to essentially um, enable our operators to better identify um, what just happened on the grid, why it happened, and how to respond and restore the system. So it's essentially uh, operations focusing on what happened to the grid, why, and what do I do about it? So some more, what are some of the key challenges that operators are having uh, as it relates to changing resources? So, um, or, or uh, as it relates to the, the, the evolving uh, the grid, one of which is changing resources. Uh, there, there are more renewables on the system, less synchronous generation um, that has that critical inertia that provides frequency response, um, uh, increased levels of DER and markets uh, on the system, where it requires operators to have more uh, or improved visibility of the system um, and more coordination between transmission operations and distribution operations, that TSO, DSO, uh, communication and linkage, uh, increased reliability, desire to restore the uh, service to systems uh, to customers sooner. And then there's, of course, there's just climate change. You know, the cha challenging, there's challenges facing utilities that are needing to restore their system and respond to these high impact, low frequency events. Um, for example, what we saw in Texas uh, in the past couple of months. Um, so some of the key modernization activities, I'm gonna go, go through some of the key areas quickly that focus on what utilities are doing to overcome some of these challenges. The first of which is sort of automation and control. And I know Mark is gonna talk a lot about distribution automation and DMS. So I'm just gonna skip over di distribution automation um, and go right to DMS, distribution management systems. You hear a lot about distribution management systems. It's the future for distribution. And many, many utilities are in the process of deploying a distribution management system now. Uh, some utilities don't have them and are in the process of, uh, of deploying them, and some are on their first generation of a, a distribution management system. So DMS, or for short, uh, obviously will help, among other things, improve visibility of the system, helping to manage and monitor the system and resources. Um, so, and actually, I think Mark is actually gonna present a little bit on the DMS as well. So I'm gonna skip right over that one, but then there's the DERMS, the DER management system. As we have a lot, uh, as we see the proliferation of DER to the distribution system, there has to be some sort of coordinated control or activity that enables that resource to be managed and integrated with the distribution management system. So we're seeing a lot of activity as it relates to DER management systems. And as it relates to the sort of the project, the, um, um, the, 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 um, the order of things, we see a lot of utilities will start with distribution automation, move on to a distribution management system, and then move to a DER management system. Then there's also the protection. Utilities are, are modernizing their protection practices uh, and are looking at using adaptive protection. Um, basically, it, it allows the protection schemes to change based upon specific conditions. We're seeing those applications being investigated for the distribution system, and a lot of the drivers behind that are DER, um, as well as increased automation. Uh, and then it just, of course, improved reliability of the system overall. And on the transmission side, we're also seeing things like wide area damping controls um, on the system. So some utilities are deploying um, these uh, wide area damping controllers that essentially limit low frequency oscillations, which can be a significant issue as, there, as it relates to limiting the power transfer capability of the system. So a number of utilities are looking at, uh, are, are deploying some new technologies as it relates to that using secret phase or measurement units and so forth. And then there's the actual control center itself. Um, in both the transmission and distribution, um, it's all about going paper free and automating manual tasks, essentially reducing non-essential workload tasks and enabling operators to focus on critical functions. So for transmission, a lot of them are looking at optimizing video walls and display designs. However, in the distribution space where control centers are also are, are, are actually being created, uh, sort of evolving from dispatch centers to control centers, 
we're actually seeing a more modular approach taken to um, the system rather than using these large video walls. So just essentially modular systems with multiple monitors. Um, and then lastly, as it relates to control centers, um, it's essentially the pandemic, um, the um, it, sort of making a, a, a control centers pandemic resilient, if you will. So a lot of utilities are rethinking their disinfection, their HVAC, their critical and non-critical spaces, et cetera. There's a lot of activity as it relates to control centers and the need to actually focus on making sure that the operators, uh, their health is of, 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 um, is of critical importance and making sure that they stay healthy to, uh, throughout the, the pandemic, as well as whatever, uh, whatever event may come in the future. So, so it gives you a brief overview of some of the things that we're seeing on the control center side. Now let's talk about some of the, um, some of the functions. Um, and I, again, I mentioned uh, operations. It's all about understanding what's happening on a system, um, you know, so that the operators can respond. Uh, so situation air, situational awareness is a very broad topic, but many utilities are working towards improving situational awareness. On the distribution side, that's deploying new sensors and leveraging AMI as a sensor. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that's a major gap as it relates to distribution and their visibility of, of seeing, quote unquote, the, end, the edge of the grid. Um, but then uh, uh, there's a, the, a lot of activities around alarm processing, and that's a transmission and distribution activity that we're seeing. Um, so, uh, you know, again, operators, their primary function is to um, essentially understand what happened, assess the situation, and, and act upon that uh, uh, this, uh, the event. Um, but we're consistently seeing operators being flooded with non-actionable information. Um, the default is essentially, we see this across the industry, is to basically send, it, send all information to an operator as an alarm and let the operator figure it out. Um, and this has resulted in overload of information being sent to operators that are non-actionable information. Um, the operator could, be see, could see 30 to 50 alarms for a single event. And so many utilities are actually rethinking their alarm philosophy. Um, and some are actually using, starting to use, look at using machine learning to uh, uh, help assess alarm systems, uh, alarm, uh, uh, alarming events and so forth. And then there's just simply response and restoration. Um, uh, fault location isolation, service restoration, or, or FLISR for short. Um, uh, many utilities are deploying or have deployed uh, some of these systems that automatically identify where the fault occurs and how to quickly restore the system in an automated fashion. And on the bulk system, the bulk transmission system, there's Black Start. As we see a lot of uh, the, the mix of renewables change, a uh, mix of generation change, a lot more renewables, Black Start systems are actually having to take that into account. Um, so, in, in summary, utilities are addressing operational challenges on many different fronts. Um, and on the next slide, I'm going to sort of quickly summarize some of the ways that utilities are preparing to, to essentially modernize planning as well. Um, so, planning criteria. Planning criteria, that's an area where um, uh, the, the proliferation of higher levels of DER, uh, increased renewables, um, um, on, the system, on, the, on the bulk system, increased reliability needs. The planning criteria are, are changing as well. That could be everything from evaluating thermal and voltage limits to looking at N minus one criteria and so forth. And on the bulk system side, there's also the, um, a, um, a lot of activity as it relates to establishing reserve requirements. Um, many utilities are, have, you know, obviously have been are starting to reevaluate their reserve requirements, um, mostly to address the variability and uncertainty in the system, um, whether that be the contingency reserves, uh, addressing instantaneous events, um, looking at fast frequency response or primary, secondary, or tertiary reserves, or that's looking at the actual ramping reserves that's addressing sort of the longer duration events, uh, also looking at secondary and tertiary reserves. But then there's flexibility reserves, regulating reserves. Um, so many utilities are actually realizing significant cost savings uh, now that they're starting to optimize their reserve margins, taking into consideration um, changes in demand, changes in resources, and so forth. And on the distribution side, uh, sort of flipping back and forth a little bit, uh, DER interconnection processes uh, within the past, I would say, decade or so, um, the, 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 the 
the onset of DER has required distribution planners and distribution engineers to rethink how they're assessing DER, distributed generation, on the distribution system. Um, basically, planners have to quickly um, process and assess and enable customers to interconnect. Um, and so they started streamlining their overall processes so that they can account for the hundreds to thousands of interconnection requests that some of these utilities are seeing. So interconnection processes, uh, as well as the analytics that go out with it, have evolved and the utilities are starting to uh, apply um, more advanced approaches that enable that customer to connect more easily. And then there's tools and analytics. Everything from forecasting to hosting capacity, non-wires alternative. Um, forecasting, you know, some of the major drivers around that are DER, electrification, climate change. Um, hosting capacity, that's a concept that has taken hold in the past five, seven years or so. Um, utilities are starting to leverage new tools that allow them to quickly assess their system's ability to host DER, and that might be um, Use, um, using these uh, the hosting capacity maps and, and using them to inform developers or using an internal to actually inform planning. Um, and then there's the nine wars alternative where we're like starting to leverage DER as a, uh, as a resource to provide either capacity uh, to the system uh, and provide uh, either um, uh, as, a, as an alternative to upgrading the system and providing a, um, you know, traditional wires upgrade sort of thing. Um, in some cases, the DER is the best answer. It may not be. So your utilities are starting to leverage suitability criteria to establish whether or not the resource DER is the right resource for the issue uh, and whether it's technically and economically feasible. And on the bulk system side, resource adequacy and flexibility. Um, there's a lot of focus laid on resource adequacy. Um, it's been a, a huge issue as of recent. Um, and so recently, uh, resource adequacy in most systems simply refer to basically establishing sufficient capacity and energy, um, traditional dispatch generation, sort of to meet uh, expected peak demand. However, there are several factors that are impacting planners to assess resource adequacy. Um, that's the changing generation mix, you know, transitioning from traditional coal, gas fired, um, to more um, weather driven re uh, renewable resources. There's the changing demand characteristics with energy efficiency programs, electrification, um, and then just simply the fact that we're having to uh, uh, incorporate energy limited resources such as batteries um, and demand response. And then there's just, and lastly, there's sort of the risk based analysis where we're trying, to, we're, we're moving away from just deterministic planning and looking at probabilistic planning. Um, where we're not just looking at peak conditions only, so that we can uh, we can we can assess those high impact load frequency um, events. And of course, grid code requirements are evolving as well, whether that be on the distribution side or the transmission side. So we've talked about the technology, the tools, processes, assets, um, but grid modernization is also about the the most important resources available uh, utilities have. And on the next slide, I'm going to cover that, um, which is essentially the workforce. Um, the, work, the workforce is the key driver behind keeping, making sure we have safe, reliable, and affordable uh, services for all customers. And many utilities are focusing on um, training uh, because the expanding we're seeing um, across the board, um, you, traditional roles for uh, either transmission engineers or, or, or utility engineers, distribution, the roles are changing, the responsibilities are changing, so new skill sets are needed. Um, in some cases, it's more interaction with a, a, a regulatory body, um, and so that means sort of the softer skills are needed, or actually um, dealing with uh, coding and actually writing Python scripts and that sort of thing to enable some of the advanced analytics. So the 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 scope of uh, of work uh, of, of workforce requirements is broadening, and so utilities are investing in that um, and, and enabling uh, new training programs to essentially. Um, uh, acquire, but also to retain top talent um, to ensure that they're, they continue to provide services to all customers. So we've covered all six major topics. I know that was a, that was a lot, um, but I want to sort of wrap up with this next slide. Um, that basically, you know, talks a little bit about um, you know, you know, how are utilities going about grid modernization? And a lot are actually leveraging um, road mapping activities. 
Um, so what is a road mapping activity? It's essentially a, a structured process to map strategy to a modernization plan um, and helps define overarching objectives and new capabilities. But critical to that is describing where a utility is versus where they want to be. As I mentioned before, everyone is, a, is in a different place along the path to grid modernization. And it's important to recognize that. Um, but it also, a grid modern, a road mapping activities also allow one to align with their industry peers. So where are, where is, where are you with respect to your neighbors or your peer utilities? Um, and lastly, it defines a logical pathway for, uh, for grid modernization, either the new tools, processes, or systems. And on the next slide, I'm just going to highlight the fact that we're, we're actually doing this very thing with a number of utilities. We, we, we've actually worked with everybody from Hawaii Electric to Southern Company um, and actually have some ongoing grid modernization road mapping activities right now working with a number of customers. Um, so, again, you know, grid modernization, um, everybody's, every utility is going through some grid modernization activity. Um, everyone, in, everyone utility is in a unique space as it relates to their journey along this path to grid modernization. Um, but there are also lessons that can be learned, whether or not you're in North America or you're in uh, the Caribbean or you're in, you're in Asia or you're in Africa or you're in Europe. There are, there are things that everyone's learning from each other because everybody's in a unique space. And some people may be doing planning really well, or some people maybe do uh, have increased situational awareness because they've deployed sensors uh, or they've learned some, they de they've developed some new analytics. Everybody sort of has a, has a, their own way of modernizing their system and lessons can be learned from each. So this is a great opportunity to, to, to share some of the things that we've seen as it relates to grid modernization that, we're, that we've experienced working with our customers. So that sort of wraps up my um, the brief presentation. Um, and I think I'll hand it back over to, to Jake. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. And um, like you said, you know, there's a lot that we can definitely learn from each other. And um, I think the, the recurring theme of your uh, presentation is that, uh, you know, the roles and responsibilities of uh, people who work on the grid is, is definitely expanding a lot. So thanks so much for that, Jeff. And uh, Mark, I'll, I'll pass the floor over to you. Thanks, Jake. And I'm just queuing up my presentation now. I'm going to share my screen. And just doing a technology check. You guys can see my screen, right? Uh, not yet. There should be a button that says share after you click which screen. All right. Um, Jeff, if you could, or Mark, could you just uh, go to display settings and then um, swap the view? I'm going to do that right now. Let's try this again. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Hey, uh, good afternoon, every morning, everybody. Good evening, good morning. I'm not sure where you're at, but I welcome this opportunity to follow up on you know Jeff Smith's presentation. And uh, I'm one of those geeky engineers. Actually, some of the stuff that Jeff was saying was resonating with me, it was giving me uh, uh, some chills, so to say, because what he talked about the journey towards grid modernization that's exactly where we've been at, at First Energy. You know, we started with distribution automation, like Jeff said, and then we studied the need to do an ADMS. And then we're, we're now presently looking at the, the ability to do a DERMS, a distributed energy resource management system to put onto our ADMS. So a lot of the stuff that, that Jeff was sharing today certainly resonates with us at First Energy because we've been part of that journey. And I really want to go out of my way to say that EPRI's been with us all along this journey, all along the way. They really help us provide focus. We think we know what we're doing, 
but it gives us the ability to, to look at what other large utilities are doing or what they've done in the past. So they're able to help guide us. So again, thanks to USAID and USEA for the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm gonna to focus my discussion today on distribution automation and, and the ADMS, the Advanced Distribution Management System. I'm gonna start by telling you that I really believe that there's uh, three or four core technologies towards grid modernization. One of them might be smart meters, AMI technology. One of them might be distribution automation that I'm gonna focus on today. Another one might be both our optimization. I have one slide on that. I'd like to share that topic really quick. And then the ADMS. Each one of these technologies are capable of advancing the grid just by themselves. But when you put the technologies together and they leverage each other, the ability to maximize the customer benefits and experience is greatly enhanced. So moving on, what I'm gonna sh share with you today is an uh, overview of First Energy. I'm gonna talk about distribution automation. I'm gonna share some significant events where we had fewer outages and quicker restoration on behalf of our customers. I'm gonna share what, what our, uh, our pilot likes at, looks like at the Cleveland and Electric Illuminating Company in Northeastern Ohio. And then I'm gonna talk about grid modernization, you know, following up on some of the stuff that Jeff Smith shared in just a little bit more detail. And then we'll talk briefly about the, the advanced distribution management system. I'll have a little bit of a focus on, on our uh, Ohio grid mod efforts, uh, but we are doing grid modernization in all 10 of our operating companies. So with that, let me explain what First Energy is. First Energy is a large utility. Uh, we, we operate in six states. We have 6 million customers. We have about 2 million customers in Northern Ohio. We have about 2 million customers in Pennsylvania, 1.1 million customers in New Jersey, and the remaining 800,000 customers in West Virginia, Virginia, and Maryland. We're about 12,000 employees at those 10 operating companies and corporate headquarters, 269,000 miles of distribution lines, and 24,000 miles of transmission lines. So we're a fairly large utility here in the United States. So what is distribution automation? A lot of distribution systems, as, as Jeff had indicated in, in his uh, uh, topic and uh, discussion today, different utilities are, are in different stages of, of uh, grid modernization. Here on this slide, I'm sharing with you uh, two substations, four circuits. You can see the substation a and B there, you see the, the four circuits, A1, A2, B1, and B2. These, these circuits here in this view go out of their substations and they go out radially. And if I was to place a fault, a carpool accident, or a tree that falls in the wire right outside substation A, for whatever period of time that those light, uh, that, that tree's on the wire, or until we can get a line crew out there to, to remedy that situation that, that caused the outage, those customers stay out of lights. So one of the ways that utilities do to, again, have fewer outages and quicker restoration is to add something called circuit ties. Circuit ties are basically reconducting or adding wires so that you interconnect circuits between substations and circuits. Now, in this, in this view that I'm sharing here, I have manual switches here, here, and here. And if I had an outage, let's say right outside substation A on circuit A1, I could actually isolate that by opening this recloser R1 and sending a line crew over to this location and either closing this switch or this switch. So the next step in the process of getting it quicker, faster, safer, and better for our employees and our customers is, is to uh, add reclosers. So where I had those manual switches in, in the previous view, now I put in these SCADA control switches that have a lot of grid intelligence and give the operators a sense of information of what's going on outside of that substation. I've got an expression and it goes something like this. Put good information in the hands of good operators, you get good decisions on behalf of our customers. The fact is, and, and I'm glad Jeff touched on this, engineers have a lot of great ideas and they just take all that information and throw it into the control center. The operators in a control center, they're like flying a commercial jetliner, right? If you give them too much information, they may not make good decisions. You wanna give them the key and most critical information 
So they, they make their decision analysis on the information, the best information in hand, not all the information. And again, I'm glad Jeff Smith made note of that. We are working with EPRI on an enlarged management strategy so that we're prioritizing the information we give to the operators. So I digress for a second to share that. But in this particular you know, offering, I'm showing you how we modernize the grid, go from a radial type distribution system, add circuit ties, and then uh, put SCADA control, remote control on those field devices so that we don't have to roll trucks to all those locations. And we can put the uh, line crew on the repair quicker. So uh, we talk about reconductoring. What's reconductoring? Sometimes those field ties already exist, but it's essentially taking thin wire, the size of your pinky, and putting up thicker wire, which is the size of your thumb, right? So you want to make sure that if you're going to sh shift a whole circuit from one uh, substation to another, you want to make sure that that end tie, that field tie, is able to carry the capacity of another circuit. And just as a tidbit, real quick, it's a good thing to size those as about 80% capacity tie. If you want more information about that, please send me an email. I'll be certain to share my thoughts on that. But sizing that for full capacity ties, you're, at, you're essentially sizing yourself, uh, spending a lot of money on infrastructure improvement that you're probably not gonna get the greatest amount of benefit for. Really, it's important to have large capacity ties and they have multiple tie, multiple tie opportunities. So how does distribution automation work? So in this particular picture that I'm showing you now, you can see we have a bit of a mess, right? This is more than a car pull accident. This is a truck pull accident. You can see a, a garbage truck backed into a pole, came over the top of the truck. We have transformers and wires. We have a lot of line crews st uh, standing around. But if we have distribution automation, here's how it works. So in this particular example, again, here's my two, two substation, four circuit design. My red circles are normally closed reclosers with grid intelligence coming back to the operator. My green circles are normally open tie points, okay? Gives me the flexibility to remotely open or close that device. So in this particular example, I'm gonna put a fault right out circuit, right outside the substation on circuit A1. Circuit A1 cycles to lockout. And as you can see, that change from red to green, green is de-energized. All the customers on circuit A1 are out of lights. What the automatic software does, or uh, Jeff referred to it as FISR, fault isolation service restoration, R1 is going to open to isolate that fault. And R5 is going to close. And what we did is we provided power flow to these sub customers downstream of R1. So essentially, if our customers were split up a third, a third, and a third, we got two thirds of our customers back in lights. And in fact, here where we operate, if it's less than six minutes, it's classified as a momentary outage. It's, it's not a sustained outage. So we've had this system in service here at First Energy at the Cleveland Electric Illuminating Company since June of 2013. The system does run in automatic. It does take a conservative approach to restoration. Sometimes I've seen operators be a little bit more aggressive. As an engineer, I don't want to design it to restore everything. I want it to make good decisions based on the best available information. And if the operator wants to go further, the operator can. But in the particular example that I just shared, we've had numerous events, in fact, about 350 to be exact, over the last eight years of operation and as a result of that, we've seen about 9% fewer outages and about a 28% improvement in restoration for those customers that have seen an outage. So again, not intended to be an eye chart here, but to give you an idea of where we deployed this technology, it wasn't as simple as the example I gave you. We actually have 14 substations, 36 circuits, and about a 400 square mile area in Northeastern Ohio, specifically in Jaga County. And these 36 circuits support about 45,000 customers here at, at, at First Energy at the Cleveland Electric Illuminating Company. So again, the green, green circles are normally open tie points. Those are locations that in the past, if I had an outage, a carpool accident, or a tree in a wire, to affect partial restoration, to get the lights back on, 
but not in the target or faulted zone. I would have to roll a line truck there to open. I'd send then send this truck over to another location to close. And that other location to close is, is again, the green circle. The red circles are normally close points, but we bifurcated the circuits to make sure that our impact zones affect a fewer number of customers. Again, here's a great example of how this technology works. In this particular example, it wasn't a car pull accident. It wasn't a tree in the wires, but at this Nelson substation, right in the middle of our, our smart grid, we lost transmission supply in the substation. That's where our centralized software approach to distribution automation far excels what we call local or loop scheme DA. In this particular example, we lost our transmission supply into the substation at not quite 11 o'clock at night. Uh, 5,400 customers were out of lights on circuits one, two, three, and four out of Nelson. The system software was able to make decision analysis and make load shifts on the tie circuits, freeing up capacity such that no less than 24 reclosers were asked to either open or close in, in a very specific sequence and restoring those customers, those 5,400 customers in less than six minutes. So every one of these customers avoided an outage. On the average smart grid DA event that we experience here at, at First Energy, we save a, a savings of about 60,000 customer minutes interrupted or what I call CMI. That's analogous to SADI, if you know the term is SADI. But in this particular event, all these customers avoided an outage because we got the lights back on in less than six minutes. And in this particular instance, we saved over 500,000 customer minutes interrupted. An exceptional event, you know, uh, probably what we call a grand slam home run, uh, giving you a baseball term there. So another example of where we deployed smart grid and where we didn't. In this particular example at Leo substation, the acronym is LO in the upper left-hand corner. Leo, we had animals get into the substation and they caused the substation to shut down. Now we didn't know that until we sent somebody in there, but in this particular event, at about four o'clock in the afternoon, animals got in the substation, caused an outage, circuits one and four out of Leo had our smart grid distribution automation. Those customers were automatically load shifted and tied out automatically by software in four minutes and 25 seconds. Circuits two and three that are not shown here yet, but I'm happy to say that we're doing grid modernization on them now. Circuits two and three, until we could get somebody in the substation and assess what was going on, we did not get their lights back on for two hours and eight minutes. So this is just an ex a great example of two of the four circuits had distribution automation, the other two didn't. And the customers that had smart grid, four minute outage, the customers that didn't have it, a two hour outage. So moving on, I always ask my engineers these four questions. When we have an opportunity, we have an event, did it work? If it did, what did it save? How many outages do we avoid it? Or how much quicker did we get the lights on? And if it didn't work, if we didn't get that maximum opportunity, why didn't it? Let's make improvements and get it fixed so that the next opportunity, we actually excel and work better towards what our, we want our customers to experience. And I'm happy to say, and I included this verbiage here at the bottom. Remember I said, we've had this system in operation for, for uh, close to eight years. And it's an evaluation of the settlement. We, we got ordered to do more of this type of work in Ohio. The Ohio Public Utility Commission, that's our regulatory agency here in Ohio, gave substantial weight to the company's experience in this pilot area. I am very proud of that. I'm very proud of that. And uh, I think Jeff Smith and the other EPRI folks have, have heard me say this. We, we, we make sure that we just don't create it and throw it over the fence to our operations center. I have a team of engineers that pretty much babysit this thing every day and make sure that it's sitting there at the ready to provide the maximum customer benefit. So again, a summary table of the results that we've seen out in our pilot area, our 36 circuits, 14 substations, 400 square miles, uh, 45,000 customers. 
Since June of 2013, we've had 353 events. We average about four events per month, which equates to about one per week. We saved over 20, nearly 21 million customer minutes interrupted. We've avoided 58,000 outages. No, I'm sorry, correction, 91,000 outages that we've actually avoided. The average event, we save about 58,000 customer minutes interrupted. And what this means at the end of the day, the average customer that lives in Geauga County is seeing just about a one hour reduction in outage time per year. It just goes to show you that distribution really works on behalf of our customers. When we measure the performance, if we just look at the mainline operation of our distribution circuits here in this area, we see a, about a 50% improvement and the restoration of, of have, have we not done it, here's what the customer experience would have been versus we did it and this is what the customer experience was. So about a 50% improvement in reliability. But then when you wanna look at overall circuit performance, you have to include what we call the tap outages, you know, the, the taps off the main line. You have to include those in the denominator. And so when you do that overall circuit calculation, it equates to about a, still about a 30% improvement in overall circuit reliability. So I strongly encourage you, I have one of my engineers monitoring the chat while I'm presenting here. If you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to put it in there. I know uh, Jake's probably gonna open up the mics at the end, but if you have any questions while I'm presenting, go ahead and pop it in there. And one of my engineers, John Stoddard, will be sure to, to, to answer any questions you have on this. So I'm now gonna move on and I'm gonna talk about volt bar optimization. Volt bar optimization, what is that? In this particular diagram, I have a substation on the left-hand side down there in the lower left-hand corner. And this is the distribution profile so that we make sure that we serve customers with adequate voltage, plus or minus 5% on a 120 volt scale. Customers right outside substation A might see like 125, 126 volts. And the customers at the end of that distribution feeder see about 114 volts. So you can see that here in the, in, in the diagram. Customer here at the head end, about 126 volts. Customer at the tail end, about 114 volts. Now it's physics. The power that goes through a meter, the volts times the amps equals the watts, right? And it's been said that if you can, if the use is the same, let's say Jeff and I live at the same on the same circuit, but one of us is at the beginning of the circuit, one of us is at the end. It's been said that if we can lower Jeff's circuit voltage, his, his, his en uh, service entry voltage at the meter, that he can save a little bit of money on his electric bill. And, and in theory, in practice, this truly works. So I'm gonna show you what we do for volt bar optimization. As we add capacitors to the distribution circuit, we're able to flatten that voltage profile. And then if we're able to flatten that voltage profile, we wanna make sure that the customer at the end of the circuit has 114 volts. We now have the ability to lower the overall circuit voltage profile. So if you remember when, at the beginning, my, my customer Jeff right outside the substation had a 126 volts. Now Jeff's voltage is, is lower by six volts and I'm still adequ adequately serving the customer at the end of the circuit by adding capacitors. That difference between my starting point and my end point is the energy savings that customers realize as a result of doing volt bar optimization. Now here's why I'm excited about it. In, in true distribution operations, when you have circuit ties and whether you're using SCADA controlled switches or SCADA controlled reclosers or truck rolls with manual switches, when you shift uh, customers from one circuit to another, sometimes you get the lights on, but the lights are dim. We've all seen that. The lights are on, but the lights are dim. If you have volt bar optimization working in con conjunction with distribution automation, you not only have fewer outages and quicker restorations, but you're optimizing the voltage that we uh, serve customers with. So if you remember, I told you at the beginning how these different smart grid technologies stand alone, they provide good customer benefits, but when they work together, you're able to maximize those good benefits. So the Ohio Commission ordered us to do grid modernization in Ohio. And remember, we did 36 circuit pilot. Now we're gonna do 
the 200 additional circuits with distribution automation at our three operating companies in Ohio. We're gonna do 202 additional circuits with volt bar control. And you're gonna target this technology so that you get the maximum number of customers under this technology. So we have about 2,800 distribution circuits in Ohio. But if I take 200 divided by 2,800, I get about 7%. So by targeting 7% of our most populated circuits, our worst performing circuits, our circuits that have the greatest opportunity for improved reliability, we're able to impact, directly impact reliability for 18% of our customers. So let me repeat that. 7% of our circuits gets us 18% of, of our customers. So as you look at grid modernization, you want to categorize and decide where you're going to deploy this technology. You want to create the maximum amount of benefits. And guess what? For the customers that don't see this technology directly, their outage gets attention quicker because the automatic software is addressing some of the other outages on behalf of the operators. So as we do more and more of this, we have the opportunity to affect all our customers. Now I wanna talk quickly about the ADMS. So Jeff did talk about all this grid intelligence that we're bringing back in, good information on, on behalf of good operators, good decisions for our customers. The fact is when we were doing the pilot, we found that we were actually given our information uh, uh, too much information for the operators. If I ask engineers that are designing this, what information do you need? We bring back everything in the sun, okay? The fact is the engineers say they need that. The operators don't need all that stuff. They don't need the third harmonics. If they want that information, we can give them remote access to the field devices. It's about giving the operators the most critical pieces of information so that he can affect restoration and reliability for customers. So we actually studied the need to do an ADMS uh, we had a valued consultant that helped us out with this, as well as EPRI when we were studying this. This is a view of what the ADMS might look like for us back in 2016. We actually included this graphic in, in a filing, both in Ohio and, and New Jersey, where we operate. Special credit to the U.S. Department of Energy. They created a, a view of the ADMS, and you're going to see this used quite extensively because the, the Department of Energy put effort into this, they talk about the core components of a, a distribution grid. And then up here at the top, they talk about the application, the advanced applications that work on behalf of our customers. And so the different utilities in, our, in a different state of this and being able to support this, but this is a good rendering of what the Department of Energy says, the grid distribution of the grid of future needs to look like and what it needs to support on behalf of our customers. So again, the human factors components of all this information coming in from the distribution grid. In this particular slide, at the top of the screen, this is how we operate today at First Energy. And I call it the, the swivel chair operations, where our operators walk, work through multiple panes of glass. We have our, our EMS or our SCADA system on one uh, uh, operator interface or one uh, uh, flat screen, and, th and that that uh, flat screen's talking to substation relaying and, and reclosers. But then on another screen, we have our outage management ticket, uh, system where our trouble tickets come in, right? And so the operator has to move back and forth through these multiple systems. The view of the future is where we give our operators one pane of glass so that the outage management system and the SCADA system, the remote control system, are all together in one interface and we're not doing multiple updates back and forth. So again, that's the advantage of an advanced distribution management system on behalf of your operators, but they're not working in multiple systems. They want to be able to work in one system. And then moving further, this is just a different view of this. This is how we operate today at First Energy. We bring a lot of information into our transmission SCADA, our GIS, our outage management system are separate, and we try to bring it together for our operators. Our view of the future is this integrated platform. And I'm happy to say that we're halfway through our journey with our, our, our ADMS vendor. It, it happens to be Oracle, because you're going to see that on the next slide. But there's multiple vendors in this space, multiple vendors that can support an ADMS. And then you can see here the future. Jeff talked about this, where you know you have your advanced applications for distribution automation and FLISR, also known as distribu uh, uh, distribution automation. 
And then in the future, we're already looking at a derms component to this. So moving on, this is an Oracle view of, of our ADMS. Uh, you have all the technologies that you're trying to achieve here, your outage management, plant switching, uh, Flizzer. You know, th that L in there, by the way, stands for location. So if you're Fizzer and Flizzer, Flizzer stands for fault location, isolation, service restoration. So can you use uh, mathematics to determine exactly where the carpool accident happened and you can put the crew on to repair quicker? We're dabbling in that and other utilities that had some good success with that. Uh, DR forecasting, uh, DERMS, uh, and then look into the future, the energy market. Can, can we use the information in our ADMS to allow our customers to play in, a, in an energy market with, with their DER? So you're seeing a lot, a lot of that in this view. But finally, let me close with this slide. So the grid of the future expectations, continuing to provide safe, reliable, and affordable service while adapting the system to support more customer choice, more energy usage information, greater flexibility to restore outages, integrating renewables and distributed energy resources, and finally, integrating new customer facing technology. So that's where First Energy stands today in what we call grid modernization, the grid of the future. And again, I'm, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present this to you today. So Jake, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, thank you for uh, this interesting case study. And I think you definitely, you both covered a lot um, today. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack. Um, the first question, I guess I'll just go based off of, um, uh, of Mark's slides. Um, we had a question about the business case for the uh, GM 36 project. Um, and uh, the question is, is the customer demographic a factor in, in the investment choice? Uh, very good question. And so one of the things that we've been trying to achieve is uh, taking the uh, smart grid DA to more urban areas. You know, typically, you know, as the, the evolution of the uh, distribution electric utility industry, we went from like 4 kV lower voltages to higher 13.2, uh, 1247 uh, uh, grid distribution. When we went to higher voltages, those tend to have larger customer counts on those circuits. So when you're evaluating these circuits for these advanced technology, you tend to gravitate to, to circuits that maybe not be in the city center or the more urban area. But we, I can tell you that we are looking at ways to improve uh, the customer experience in the 4 kV areas where we, where we have 4 kV delta. Uh, the, other, the other thing when we talk about the business case, and I, I didn't have it in my slides, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll make mention of it, something that the Department of Energy did, and I think EPRI had some involvement in this, Jeff, was something called the Interruption Cost Estimator, the ICE tool. And if you don't know about that, you should look it up because it does quantify the economic benefits to fewer outages and quicker restoration. So again, the Department of Energy, it's called ICE, ICE, Interruption Cost Estimator. Uh, it was developed maybe four or five years ago. And it does help you quantify what the expected economic gains are to different areas of your, of your population, your geographic areas, if you're to deploy this, te this technology. So again, uh, we, we, right now we're, we're more in a, a combination of rural and outer ring suburbs where we're looking to take this technology to, to great uh, majority of our customers. Got it. Um, thanks for that, Mark. Um, we've got a question for Jeff. Um, is there a role for Bitcoin mining which can provide a, a load source of last resort to assist in grid modernization? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So as it relates to Bitcoin mining and it, it, as, a, as a role in, um, in serving as a dispatchable load, um, it, it certainly could help with that. Um, it, it's, it's just another lever that could be used to support um, both, you know, the, the flexibility of the system so uh, if, it, if it is a dispatchable load that can be called upon um, during certain periods where there's a excess generation or, or um, 
you know, ver extra, you know, the variability on the system that could certainly support, um, you know, uh, the bulk system from a, um, a, a resource perspective. Yes. Um, and uh, here's uh, one question kind of for, for both of you. Um, are there any technologies that stand out in particular um, for grid modernization? I know both of your um, presentations talked about um, Flizzer a little bit. Um, so is there, is there anything now that kind of stands out to you? I'll take a first pass at that and I'll let Jeff follow up. So um, what we've seen in our business cases that we've presented to regulatory agencies, and again, we, we like to point to that ice tool that the Department of Energy in conjunction with EFRI, they, they developed. Um, we find that distribution automation probably provides customers the greatest amount of benefit, uh, closely followed by volt bar optimization. So if you can optimize the voltage that you serve your customers at, and if it's a bit lower, customers in general can, can save energy, can save on their electric bill, but you also reduce greenhouse gas emissions from that. So you don't have to create all this generation to support all that load. Plus VBO volt bar optimization is able to free up capacities. There's different modes of operation. It can free up capacity on a distribution system with active voltage management along that distribution feeder. And it's also can support uh, transmission system needs. Okay. So volt bar in optimization tends to follow closely behind DA. And then the third sister I refer to is AMI. AMI, remote uh, meter reading, smart meter, grid intelligence, bringing back that in. That's, to me, it's outage restoration validation. It's, it's earlier notification that I have an outage. Those kinds of things with AMI. AMI, it's, it's cost benefit analysis tends to be just about neutral. But when you put the three technologies together and they work together, they're, they're able to maximize each other. Now, you know, I sort of close with, you know, like some ADMS slides. There's other things that are important to distribution system operation, and we're trying to bring those in. We're, we are looking at DERMS and the ability to customers to, uh, to generate their own power, and we need to understand what's behind the meter and what they want to play into the market space. But that's sort of like how we rack and stack the technologies at First Energy. I would so I would follow up. I agree with what Mark just said. It's a combination of things, and it also sort of depends on where you are along that journey um, to modernization. But distribution automation, recloser deployment, AMI. A lot of utilities are um, are starting to leverage AMI operationally. It's not just about reading meters for revenue. Um, it, it, it's it's a distributed capability that gives you better visibility for your system. So it's a, it's one of those investments that um, once made can then be leveraged to provide additional um, capability to the system. So uh, I, I would concur with what Mark said. Absolutely. Um, we've got uh, another one similarly along the lines. Um, how, how critical is the role of the regulator um, in grid modernization initiatives? Again, I'll take a crack at it, Jeff. I, I think it's critical yep. and key. And um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that I've been given the opportunity to, to talk to a number of our, our, our state uh, commission staffs and, and commissioners about these advanced technologies. I also tell you that you never wanna be in a position where you overstate the expected benefit. And that's why I'm always pushing my engineers to make sure we maximize the benefit that we get good actual and factual results that we know clearly what the customer difference in reliability or uh, lower energy use exactly is so that when we share that with our, our commissions, um, that's what we're held accountable to. You know, we have to, we have to file reports, they're auditable and traceable and we can back up everything that we say. Uh, we want to make sure that we clearly articulate what the expected customer benefits are and working with our regulators is, is critical and key. We should never overestimate what the benefits are, but we don't, we don't want to also don't want to leave, do what I call lead change under the table. We, you know, we want to make sure that we clearly share with them what they can expect to see on the behalf of the customers that they represent and that we serve. 
Yeah, I, I would I would agree again agree with Mark. It's particularly in the distribution space, we're seeing a lot more activity and and need for the the distribution planners and engineers to 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 work with the regulator and to, because a lot of that modernization, a lot of that change is happening at the distribution space, um, and the commissioners, the regulatory or agencies are, are what's going to enable that to actually happen. So communicating what's what needs to happen, what the goals, you know, how to meet the goals, the targets, um, based upon where a utility system is, because uh, every utility system and um, is it, it, essentially custom built to serve the local customers. So every utility system is different. So you have to work with your regulator um, to um, to establish what's the best practice, what's the what's the path forward for your specific jurisdiction, for your specific needs, based upon what you have in the field now. Um, it, it, you know, what works in California may not work um, in, in, um, in New Jersey. What, what works in New Jersey may not work in Jamaica, may not work, you know, it's, it, it, every system's uniquely different. You have to work with your regulator to establish that strategy moving forward. So a key component for sure. And that was sort of tied to that workforce comment I had at the end where the soft skill, but the skills of actually communicating effectively um, um, to such as, you know, somebody like stakeholders or commissioners as it relates to um, volt bar strategies or DER management systems, um, it's complicated and you have to be able to communicate that effectively, what needs to happen uh, and some of the challenges that go along with that. So uh, that was a good question. Absolutely. And hey, Jake, um, Jake yeah. real quick. Um, and doing a time check, but can I can I address a couple of questions that I saw in the chat? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so some there was one, and and, and I'll let you uh, peruse what what how I'm responding here. But there's some some folks asked some questions about the outage management system. I'm remiss in saying that as we deploy an ADMS at First Energy, and I, I'm really excited. I'm responsible for those advanced apps, the the DA and the BBO. But the fact is, our biggest uh, change in our ADMS is we're actually updating our outage management system on behalf of 6 million customers. So that's the big heavy lift at First Energy in our ADMS. It's not so much the advanced apps. And again, the commissions will hold us accountable to what we contemplated when we filed our business case. But we are changing our outage management system. And then the other thing that's critical and key, and Jeff knows this, as a utility, uh, prior to this grid modernization, our system operators sort of knew what the distribution grid looked like based on the information they had in their systems and interfaces. But a lot of times there's jobs sitting in the line shop and the job packet has to come back and it's got to go through mapping and records. And that, that time delay, you know, as little as a year or two ago, that could be three or four months. And what we're getting to with our GIS is what we call as is, as operated. Even though you have information on the screen and the operator says, hey, my circuitry looks like this, but I know that I had line crews out there adding more conductor or doing different things. We really become a utility with our ADMS and we're updating our GIS as well as our OMS so that it becomes truly as is as operated. And then quickly, there was a question about the BBO and the expected savings. You can study CVR, conservation voltage reduction. That's a component of BBO. I think it's conceivable and it really depends on the customer count and the length of the circuit. But I think two and a half percent energy savings is achievable. I could tell you in Ohio, the regulators are going to hold us to 4% energy savings for the 202 circuits that we're deploying the technology. And we're not there yet. I don't lose sleep over 4%, but I know we'll be a bit challenged, but I'll, I think we're up to the challenge. So, Jake, thanks for that opportunity to quickly answer a couple of questions I saw in the chat. Back to yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think Jeff is <laughs> Jeff answered one of them in the in the chat as well. Um, so I know we're a little bit over time. So I'll just ask um, one final question, um, and it's what what is the role for real time simulators and digital twins for um, planning in addition to operations? Yeah, that is that is one. Uh, <laughs> I'll just say that that is an area that um, some utilities are starting to look at, um, particularly from a restoration standpoint. Um, in cases where you need to run, uh, look at some of the um, more advanced events 
uh, with higher levels of inverter-based resources where the system doesn't respond as, uh, as typically um, done uh, um, in the past. So that as the system evolves, some of the tools that we're looking at uh, deploying need to evolve as well. So that's one of the areas that um, we're actually working on um, with a couple of utilities looking at real-time simulators and the role in, um, in restoration um, activities. So uh, rather than using PSSE for doing some of those cases, uh, looking at actually running EMT simulations, that sort of thing. So um, that is something that we're, we see as a, as a potential in the future. We're not seeing that being used just yet. There's still a lot of things to figure out um, what makes sense from a scalable perspective, and there are a lot of challenges around that. But there also seems to be some opportunities. So that's actually ongoing research we have at EPRI. And if I could add to that, uh, for us in our ADMS, we wouldn't be in this space without a, a simulator. We want to make sure that we have a, what we call a sandbox or a test environment to make sure that these advanced apps work the way we expect them to work on behalf of our customers. And then sometimes a software vendor will upgrade the DA or VBO technology. We do regression testing to make sure that the fixes or enhancements that they provided didn't break previous functionality. Regression testing is critical and key because the number one thing with, that we do is we safely operate the grid and we would never wanna uh, put software in a place that we haven't tested. We wanna ensure that our, our, our field forces can be safe as well as our customers can be safe. So we do have a simulator in, as we're deploying this ADMS. Uh, you know, Jake, I, I would follow up, and I think Jeff's email's out there. If anybody has any questions, feel free to feel free to email. I'll be sure to get back to them. Great, thank you, uh, thank you both so much um, for taking the time today to present and, and answer a bunch of questions. Um, to everyone that attended this webinar, um, we will be sending you um, a recording of the the webinar and the PowerPoint presentations, which I believe have. Um, Jeff and Mark's emails in them. Um, but thank you all for joining us today. Um, there's a quick survey after the webinar um, and your participation is greatly appreciated. Um, if you have any comments, please feel free to send them to me um, and be on the lookout for upcoming grid modernization webinars that will take place earlier next month. Um, so thank you all for joining and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Thanks.